Well, welcome everyone from what in the data is happening this summer. This uh, webinar is actually um, being created because of the VRMA Executive Summit that we had and uh, Jason made a, an incredible presentation on what is going on in the marketplace right now. And the request came from the industry that they wanted to hear some more about it. And we felt timing was ideal to put a webinar together, together with uh, Key Data Dashboard and AJL Atelier. So we welcome you to this uh, webinar today. While I'm already in uh, super hot Spain, um, uh, enjoying the summer and the summer vacation, I think it's great timing also in relation to what has just recently happened. And uh, we've seen some data being published that uh, predicted uh, the going down of Airbnb and, and many other things. And that has created a lot of traction and a lot of interest to talk about data and put some data out there to give some perspective what is really happening this summer. And uh, we felt uh, this was a good opportunity to show the vacation rental professional industry um, some data in relation to the United States and also in Europe. So Melanie will run us through the presentation. We urge you to uh, ask questions. We have a question board here as well that Jason and I can, can address. And then uh, after we've seen the data uh, and the presentation, then we'll dive into some deeper conversations. And we obviously would like to make this as interactive as possible. So I'm Simon Lehmer from AGL Atelier, uh, Jason Sprenko, uh, Melanie. Um, why don't you take it on? Sure, Jason, you wanna give a quick introduction just so people can place uh, voices to names today? Yeah, just excited to be here. Like Simon said, a lot of noise out there about what's happening, excited to put some data behind it. Uh, anybody who saw my presentation or heard about it uh, when I was lucky enough to be with Simon, uh, down in Palm Beach earlier knows that I stand on Melanie's shoulders whenever I'm presenting data. So excited to have it coming straight from uh, the source this morning. Thank you all for joining us. Thanks for the credit, Jason. So I'm Melanie. I lead the analytics team um, here at Key Data Dashboard. Excited to, to jump into the data and kick off some conversations with Jason and Simon today. Um, we do have a questions box. If any super urgent ones come through, if, somebody forgets to tell you what ADR means, uh, just go ahead and drop that in the question box and we'll do our best to get to it. Um, and then if we don't get to all the questions, which we probably won't, feel free to just contact us. I know our information is available on our website. So with that, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. Um, we're gonna kind of focus on the US to begin with, and then we'll jump into European trends as well. Some differences right now, so we've, we've separated them into two different sections. Um, here we're looking at the adjusted paid occupancy rate just for the summer months. Adjusted paid occupancy is the number of guest nights out of nights available to be booked. So since we work directly with property management companies around the world, we can see um, with truth whether a reservation is an owner, a guest, or a hold night. So with all of our adjusted KPIs, we take out those owner and hold nights and look at kind of bookings out of the nights actually open to be booked. Um, in the U.S. this summer, we're looking at on the books as of July 4th uh, in that kind of burnt orange red color on the bottom. Um, we're looking at occupancy rates about 5% lower than last summer um, and even back down below 2019 by about a percentage points point. So down from 50% on the books at this time last year to 45% this year. Uh, we've also got that final line in blue. So in the next, you know, half of the summer, the next six weeks or so, we expect occupancy rates to increase by about 10% or so as those kind of last minute reservations continue to come in. Um, so definitely occupancy softening in the U.S. for the summer. Hey, Melanie, just to point out there to state the obvious, but uh, it'll come up in our conversations today. So just a reference to, to 2019, as we talk to a lot of our professional managers and kind of hear about the softening on the occupancy and, you know, you read about this sky is falling mentality that some people are putting out there, unfortunately, with some, with some data that was inaccurate. I'll jump more into, you're seeing an occupancy right now that's essentially equivalent to 2019 for the same time of year, right? 1% down per, from a perspective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple of different things playing into that, which we'll touch on more as well. So supplies kind of bounced back from, from lows during 2020 and early 2021. Um, so there's more competition out there. We're also seeing kind of a return to some more normal traveler trims. Um, 
So maybe they're, they're shifting back to destinations they used to go to, like cities instead. It's kind of on both fronts right now. We're seeing higher supply than we did during kind of that peak 2021 period, as well as a return to normal traveler trends, kind of all adding up, which we'll talk in more detail about later, to softer occupancy on the books for the summer than what we've seen in the prior two summers. But yes, Jason, you're 100% right. We're, we're not really seeing the sky falling at this point, just kind of a readjustment and a return to normalcy. I wish we could go back to 2019. I, I know that for our owners that joined in 2021, this won't ring as true, and we'll talk some more about owner communication. But I think if, in 2019, if we could have said, what if we could keep occupancy right where it is and significantly increase rates, we would have been pretty happy from an overall, uh, you know, historical perspective, but certainly with what we saw in 2021, uh, you know, some conversations to be had on the occupancy side. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll make a note, you know, we work, this is again, directly from professional property management companies. So kind of concentrated in the core leisure markets. Um, we have a lot of urban data mixed into this as well, but it, it may reflect your, your trends a little bit more in those leisure markets than it does in urban. Um, and then with all of it, there's tons of variation across regions, across markets. Uh, so even if your data doesn't match this directly, it is always helpful to know kind of what's happening at the macro level as well. Okay, the occupancy softened. We've seen rates come down a little bit in the U.S. for the summer as well. Um, still quite high and, and well above where we were pre-pandemic, well, almost $100. So 2022, Summer, occupant, or summer average daily rate, the average uh, amount of revenue booked per guest night, um, was at $453, down um, under 10%, but still down to about $441 this summer. Um, so starting to see kind of the decline of pricing power as occupancy is, is falling a little bit year over year as well. I think out of challenges, we've talked to our professional managers and our customers and partners about um, pricing is a really big one right now. Jason and Simon would love to hear your input, um, but I think trying to continue, do you, do you continue to boost revenue by increasing rates a little bit year over year, kind of helping make up for that declining occupancy? Do you go ahead and drop rates and hope that you get enough bookings to make up for it is one of the biggest challenges and kind of balancing acts we're hearing, hearing from customers in the U.S. right now. Yeah, I mean, you know, from my perspective, and it, it, obviously the caveat is it's nuanced and it's specific to what's happening in your market, in particular with respect to the supply in your market for the type of inventory you have, and whether you have commoditized type of units or whether you have big, unique seven bedrooms that book well in advance, obviously changes your perspective for the end of summer. But I mean, overall, you know, the the inflation in the U.S. is cool to about 4%. Unemployment is still incredibly low. I think the, the collective wisdom is that the feds are going to continue to to hike rates a little bit until they can you know make a little bit more of a disruptive impact or kind of force a recession here in the u.s um and so you're, you i think you're, you're 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 having what seems to me to be this kind of cautious approach towards um rates but there i mean the reason i i, I enjoy your kind of historical perspective slides is you know, these rates are still so incredibly high compared to, to where we've been, his, you know, only down from kind of this incredible uh, stratosphere of 2022 in terms of where the rates were pushed. And I think rightfully so, right? We'll see some good rep bars um, and where rates really saved us over the last uh, little bit here. But um, I, I think I think we've got to be really cautious in terms of watching the economy. And um, it's clear that there are some price conscious shoppers out there. And so it's very dependent upon your inventory, but I do think there's some opportunities for those that can get ahead of it uh, and find those pockets of shoppers who are looking uh, to still travel, but be uh, cautious in their spend. Like there's, there's no doubt both in Europe and the US, and we'll talk more about some of the surveys and stuff here a little bit, um, that you've got the shoppers out there. You've just got some cautiousness in their, in their spending habits. They wanna be there, they just don't wanna overspend. And so if you can, you can capture that traveler and continue to push your occupancy a little bit without pulling down too too far. Um, I, I think you're going to see the best results, but again, highly dependent upon where you're at. I think we've been reading I, I a lot about that. sticker shop. Stop. Sorry, Melanie. Just... All right, Simon, I'll go ahead. Yeah, 
I think we've we've been reading a lot about sticker shock where people are kind of going back to book that large house they used to or did in 2021 or 2020, realizing how much it costs and kind of going for a smaller or less expensive unit, um, as well as kind of switching from the, the standard classic, like more expensive leisure destinations, and maybe finding some of those hidden gems that are priced a little bit lower, um, maybe a little less developed, more rural, but definitely seeing some implications of, of sticker shock is happening, right? People are continuing to see rate increases or just they're so much more expensive than they were pre-pandemic. And so kind of framing and changing decisions as around that as well. Simon, what were you gonna say about that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I second what you and Jason said. I think I, the only thing I would add to that is, while we've been obviously pushing rates quite substantially, we also need to be conscious of what we're delivering as, a, as an experience as well, and how do we differentiate our product? And, you know, just being in a rental myself, once again, it just, become so obvious you know we need to do a lot more well above the relationship with homeowners and, and how we can differentiate and improve our products and amenities um, that we're delivering to these type of customers in order to keep these rates at, at, at this level um, because if we're not living up to that then it's going to be extremely challenging to keep them that way and we need to include the homeowners into this conversation to make sure we can we, we can deliver that type of expectation um, together with the amenities that we have on offer, because if we don't do that, especially to customers that we have converted post-COVID from hotels to vacation rental, then we will lose these customers again and, and the market might um, cool off quicker because we can't uh, deliver the product consistency. And, and I think that is more in relation to revenue management, but also in, in relation to operation. We need to be extremely mindful of that to keep it on that level. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Simon. So providing the value associated with kind of the rate you have your property put to that, right? So as an example, maybe if $300 a night, people were okay, like starting a load of laundry before they left. If it's now $450 a night and there's a cleaning fee attached, then it, it may be time to kind of readjust uh, your checkout strategies and your amenities as well to make sure that you're continuing to provide that value and people don't, don't start going back to hotels and stuff. We got a uh, great, great question in the comments. Somebody asked what's OTB. You'll see it on the top right of the chart. It's on the books. So this is for reservations booked by July 4th and every year. So you can see pacing and true comparison year over year. We don't want to look at summer 2023 um, as of now compared to summer 2022 final um, because people will continue to book. Reservation pickup will continue to happen. Melanie, could you explain why it, it, why it falls between now and final? Sure. So people generally book their kind of cheaper stays closer to arrival. So at this point, we're still seeing a lot of those like week long large house stays on the book. Um, as we continue to move into like the final month in August, we'll start seeing people book those two to three day stays that they book two weeks in advance and they're kind of looking for a great deal. So those uh, will start pulling the average daily rate down as we get kind of through the summer through the stay period. Look at how occupancy and rate changes have added up at the kind of the bottom line here. We're looking at adjusted ResPAR, that same chart. So this is the average number or average amount of revenue generated per night that was available. So kind of averaging your book nights across your unbooked nights. Um, we are seeing some pretty big year over year declines in ReFPAR due to declines in rates and occupancy. Um, so currently at about $200, a night per property in the U.S. on average for the summer, uh, compared to 230 last summer, which is uh, a 10 to, or a larger than 10 percent, about a 15 percent decline year over year. So revenue is really coming down. Um, Simon and Jason, a couple of things I would love your thoughts on is kind of implications for supply changes moving forward, and then secondly, kind of implications uh, for dealing with homeowners for our property managers who are seeing these large declines. I'll tackle Jason, the you go first. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, you guys have heard us preach about it since the day we started the company. But um, I, I think communication with homeowners is always incredibly, uh, you know, critical to a successful business, not to be trite. 
Uh, I think everybody knows that, but it's particularly critical when you've got, you know, some explaining to do, as as my wife would say. Um, you've got, you know, you've got numbers that are moving down, and you've certainly got owners that uh, bought in 2021 or 2022 uh, may have seen forecasts for revenue, uh, may have bought your company uh, in 2021 or 2022, and, and done it uh, based on this, you know, historical ever climbing rates, ever climbing occupancy, ever climbing rev par, which we saw for it felt like, you know, the entirety of the 15 years that I had my vacation rental business. And to see any kind of pullback certainly requires a conversation. But, you know, many of our owners have been with us for longer than that. Um, and it's it's always insightful to see 2019 is kind of a watershed uh, year for benchmarking. I mean, we remember it as a, at the time, a very positive year that it, it was on the heels of, like I said, for me, about 15 years of growth year after year, where it seemed like that you just got up at the beginning of the year and you cranked up you know, your rates five or 10% and you called your owners and high fived and they were happy and the forecasts were relatively met a little trite, but that was, it was much easier at the time. And now there's a lot more of a need to be both managing your rates and managing your owner communications. And so I think the point for me is the, the more you can discuss with them what's happening, uh, not just from a macro perspective, but from, you know, the macro within your uh, geography, um, the better they are uh, to get a sense that you've got your hands on the wheel, as we like to say, and that you're focused and you can differentiate how their property is doing relative to other properties. Um, you know, context, critical for owners. I think owners are are um, are, are, are willing and, and, and capable of understanding the Rev Park conversations and the macroeconomic conversations and really just want to know if you're a good steward of their property and, and do you have your hands on the wheel? And so being able to reflect back to where we sit relative to 2019 and being able to reflect very specifically where they sit uh, in comparison to their competitors, I think will give them the confidence that they need to stick with you. Jason, we love yeah, I, for that as well. Um, so saying, hey, you've got a four bedroom house in this market. Here's how other four bedroom houses like kind of similarly situated in your same market are performing compared to last summer. Like A, it can be a really good opportunity to say, A, like actually they're right, I am behind the market and need to do some adjustments. But you can also say to your homeowners with that data, like, hey, everybody's down 10% year over year. Here are the strategies I have in place to remedy that. Like maybe you're actually doing a little bit better than the competition in the market, but it's, it's not just us. Like you don't need to run screaming to find a different property manager or to do it yourself. It's just the market adjustment. So those comp sets can be really helpful to frame those conversations. Yeah, 100%. I think silence will generate more churn than anything else. Way, way more than bad news. Sorry, Simon, go yeah, ahead. I, I, you know, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you, but I would like to take this uh, a level further. Um, obviously, we all sound like broken records, Jason, and, and our record says, you know, and if we're not doing one thing very well in our industries, being um, very good in, in trans like transporting the value proposition to homeowners and what property managers are really doing to keep uh, ahead of the game. And I think, especially now, while it's become more competitive as the market is softening, it's, it's, it's obvious that the market will become more competitive. So therefore, um, there will be PMCs, property managers out there trying to get homeowners at lower rates or whatever, and even be more aggressive. And I think we need to also make sure uh, to, to address to homeowners, hey, what have we done in the meantime to stay on top of stuff like home automation, uh, investing in additional technologies, revenue management, you name it, and, and, and to your point, being totally transparent to homeowners about what's going on. Because I think a lot of homeowners think, you know, they're like, they're being pulled over the table that other things are being done to create revenues. And and these relationships are now very important. And, and, the home, and property managers, in the meantime, have invested a lot in resources, in training, in technology, and everything else. And, and the homeowner just looks at, in a way, what am I getting in my pocket at the end of the day? But the work that's behind multi-channel distribution, um, you know, finding talents, executing on 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 guest experience levels and everything else is, is sort of missing. And it's it's not about justification, but it's really showing the homeowners what is property management all about and and, and what do we do 
to maximize the returns and, and, and have good results for them and also good guest experiences, I think is, is absolutely crucial. And the second one, I would add to that is and and you know staying in a rental myself again this summer with my fam is to to point out to homeowners hey where does work need to be done in order to deliver consistent good results on the property where property is getting tired because they've been milked for revenue um, that also um, is something that we need to address openly with the homeowners to make sure that because the guest experience is increasing as we all know and if these units are not delivering what we're expecting, then we're facing massive challenges as well. Yeah, really well said. I mean, it's it's a trust relationship in the end, right? And I think you've got to use any opportunity and movement in the numbers to, to build that trust through communication. Um, on, on Melanie's question on the supply side, Simon, we were chatting earlier about kind of the, the two opposing forces in terms of what could drive supply. I guess start with the baseline, Melanie. Supply in the US, has been growing like crazy. You're, you're, the short version, as I understand it from you, is that's, that's starting to soften or slow down a little bit, right? Yeah, so like June, for example, last season, we were seeing like 20 to 25% year over year increases in the, the number of listings available in the US. This year, we'll, we're still seeing an increase, but it's been like 12 to 14% instead of 20 to 25. So competition supply is still increasing, kind of moderating a little bit more after the huge year over year increases we saw over the prior two years. And Simon, our opposing points on supply uh, maybe be helpful here. Mine was that, um, you know, you've got, you got compressed cap rates, right? You've got more and more talk of kind of occupancies down. There was an awful lot of uh, kind of chatter about how everybody should quit their jobs as I saw it and, and go out and run and buy a bunch of Airbnbs and, and host them and you'll you'll make your fortunes. Uh, and that, uh, you know, that's a little bit exaggerated, obviously, but that was a lot of the kind of speculation around just what an opportunity there was out there in the marketplace. And I think you're seeing that obviously with, with home prices pushed up, mortgage rates uh, continuing to increase, the Fed still pushing rates a little bit more expected you're just you're not seeing quite the opportunity in terms of cash flow and cap rates, and I think that will be a factor that helps pull back a little bit in the supply, or kind of continue to pull back and give demand a, a chance to to push up. But you you were explaining this morning kind of the the counter to that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's something that I'm obviously very mindful about, having looked at this, you know, let's call it for me an Airbnb bubble that anybody can own and highly leverage an Airbnb, just throw it on one channel and, and, and make a return and, and have a better cap rate in long term versus short term. And hey, this is amazing. And and, and we have endless amounts of, of uh, webinars and podcasts talking about how do you maximize your investment and, and how you can do that still on a single channel. I mean, which all, you know, is mind boggling for me. Um, you know, I have gone through um, the subprime crisis in 2008, the financial crisis, when, when the lending market and the real estate business just totally collapsed and, and, and the market was flooded by properties that people couldn't literally afford their mortgages anymore. You know, a lot of Germans, uh, British people owned properties in, the, in, in, in Spain. We saw, we saw property value dropping by 400% within a no period of time. So that means the banks were sitting on assets that they just throw into the rental market to at least make a little bit of money uh, because obviously there was no buying market for it. So the market, there was a massive market correction in terms of valuation. And obviously we're not predicting anything similar, but we need to be extremely mindful that there's a lot of supply out there that is highly leveraged to have higher cap rates and, and make a living out of just making rentals on the market. And I think we need to be cautious of these type of units coming in because we're also seeing signs that the professional market is actually currently improving the number of listings versus individ individuals managing it. So that could already be a sign that we're seeing more units coming into the professional managed market because people just sort of want to see what they can do with these units even better, what they can do themselves uh, uh, as well. So I think my prediction is that if if it continues and 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 then we have seen interest rates hiking quite considerable cost of capital has increased 
um, that we could see even a bigger change. Because one thing we, we, we don't talk about in our industry a lot at all uh, is what is still out there in terms of supply that is unrented supply. You know, we're not assuming that every second home is, is just being naturally rented. It's obviously not, especially in Europe or markets like Switzerland, actually the, the majority is still not rented. And, and this could change. This could change considerably that people think, hey, now uh, this is becoming a very expensive second home for us. Um, and, we, you know, we, we need to rent this out to make, to make some additional money. Um, energy costs have risen. Uh, interest rates have risen. So when I bought this property 10 years ago in Spain, it cost me now three times more a month uh, than it, what it cost me at the time. So I might need to think about um, renting that out, which I've never rented. And, and obviously, that's the market that we have no numbers on. How, is, how big is the market? And that's something we need to be mindful when we talk about supply as well. Yes, that's great. a really good point. And I think let's kind of move on after this because we've got a lot to cover. But I think it's one of the drivers behind huge increases in supply in kind of late 2020, 2021, early 2022 was all of these properties that had once been a rental. So they were on the market in 2019. Homeowners pulled them off either because they just didn't want to deal with that in the midst of COVID, kind of safety concerns, or because they were staying in that property themselves for a year while they weren't tied to their office desk. Um, and so it was kind of like ripe supply, like these properties were mostly rental ready. You just had to activate the listed again. So it kind of helped contribute to that huge year of year increase and, and growth that we saw in the previous couple of years. Let's talk about booking sources a little bit because we are or booking behavior we are seeing some pretty big shifts so the average booking window for the summer thus far is at about 94 days so people booking on average 94 days in advance of their arrival in the u.s down from 99 days at this time last year obviously shifting booking windows uh can make it hard to kind of know when to adjust your last minute prices when you start panicking that your your rental's not well booked for a certain stay date yet um, so that's definitely a big thing to keep an eye on. A lot of markets with quite large declines in booking windows as people wait longer to kind of see how things are going to go and to plan their trip at that point. Um, the average is great to look at, kind of macro trends, not quite as actionable. In the U.S., we're seeing kind of the highest categories. This is the bottom of the screen. The largest number of reservations per property coming in under two weeks from the state dates or 60 plus days in advance. Um, but 15 to 16 or 60 kind of all right there together as well. This is kind of last minute stays booked 14 days out of 1% year over year, kind of the only increase we're seeing across these different booking window categories. Um, 60 plus days out is definitely something I want to draw your attention to. We're seeing 5% fewer reservations per property booked 60 plus days out. It's kind of the biggest um, decline we're seeing right now, which may indicate that people are feeling some trepidation not quite as excited to plan a stay from 60 days for now as they were last year. Could be due to economic situations or just increased uncertainty about the future as well. I'm gonna keep trucking um, here and look at KPIs by booking source. The top row in blue, we have the number of arrivals per property booked for summer stays um, for each of these platforms. So, um, some interesting things here. We're seeing Airbnb up only 2% year over year. Booking.com up 34%. That's from like 0.19 to 0.25 reservations per property. So, not a huge contributor, but it's seeing the most growth. I think this is something super interesting and something Simon, Jason, and I were talking about earlier today. Direct stays down 14% year over year, Verbo down 10% year over year. So definitely continuing to see kind of a, a shift in booking channels as well and, and Airbnb seeing the most growth. Average daily rates kind of reflect that a little bit, um, but kind of also the inverse, the rates down 8% on Airbnb, booking down 3%. Direct is the only category still increasing, which is, is interesting because it has the largest decline. So direct booked rates up 3%. Verbo down 5%, so continuing to see some shifting and movement there as well. As a percentage of revenue, we're not seeing large year over year increases. Um, important to note, direct still brings in about 50% of overall revenue for our US property managers. Um, 
even though that the number of stays booked directly is, is declining, a slight increase in the average daily rate is kind of balanced that out to some extent, um, as well as the decline in Verbo. Um, some interesting things to note, in case you don't know already, in the US, direct stays tend to be kind of longer stays, more luxury properties booked at higher rates, which is why it's, it's not a huge number of arrivals per property in comparison to the other channels, but does bring in the, the majority of the revenue for a lot of our property managers with Verbo close behind at about 30% of summer revenue being booked on that platform. So I think that's an interesting takeaway here. And, and in the quick summary, looking at that slide, the luxury rental market receives a lot of attention at the moment from also investment standpoints, private equity and everything else, shows super solid performance. I mean, even increasing uh, ADRs while direct bookings go up, so they benefit from that. They're old established brands very hard on their product seem to be able to do to, to, to make gains there which is which is actually quite impressive when you consider that direct is going down by 14 percent but but the ADR is is nearly twice as much and you, what you're seeing on booking or or, or even higher than verbo so it, it clearly shows that you know the type of properties that are being asked for and, and what is being paid for is, is definitely under a uh, quite a bit bit of a challenge if you if you want to call it that way yeah i think it's also linked into some regional dynamics um when we're looking at the u.s overall so i've mentioned this a couple of times in 2020 2021 we saw these leisure destinations so mountain beach uh, do really well year over year right people are not taking their urban trips they're not taking a cruise they're not going to europe so instead they're going to like the coast of north and south carolina or florida or the Tennessee mountains or the California or Colorado mountains. Um, a lot of those destinations rely pretty heavily on direct and Verbo reservations. Um, urban's a little more geared towards Airbnb. And so if we've seen kind of, again, a return to normal travel trends, it's caused this decline in direct and Verbo as well. So people going back to cities and away from the beach, kind of, or kind of artificially, but are gonna impact how the different channels perform year over year. Just a quick note on booking. A lot of people have been waiting for them to kind of show up more in the U.S. They've obviously been making some intentional efforts. Still very small numbers, but you do see a jump there into the 2% on the percentage of revenue. And it's a small points there, but on arrivals per property, obviously gaining the most. I pointed out to juxtapose it against this same slide uh, that we'll see in Europe. Uh, and so when we see the European slide, uh, the, for those in the U.S., consider the opportunity here that bookings got left in the U.S. in terms of performance. I, th I think they're on their way. Stay links down slightly year over year. So from 5.2 on the books last year to four five days this year, um, maybe seeing some slight sh uh, signs that people want to travel but are, are taking a slightly shorter trip, right? Cutting down uh, one day can easily drop your overall budget for the trip by 10 to 15%. Um, at a minimum. And so still shorter stays on average. Again, this is geared towards kind of our longer stay professional property managers, um, but, but shorter stays on average than what we were seeing pre-COVID. Um, in the US, the main thing that's sticking out to me right now is just some, some moderate changes have added up to a pretty big change here in the amount of revenue booked per property on the summer. So I think sometimes we look for like, oh, there's this big answer. There's this one thing causing all the shifts we're seeing. 2020 is a great example. March of 2020, revenue was really, really low because nobody was allowed to travel, right? It was a, it was a lot of restrictions in the midst of, of the pandemic. Um, this summer, we're seeing an increase of about 13% in the number of properties that our professionals manage in the US, which kind of tracks closely to what we're seeing in overall supply on Airbnb and Verbo. Guest check-ins as a whole are still increasing. So the number of guests staying with our managers are up 6% year over year for the summer or for June. Um, guest check-ins per property though are down 6%, right? So supply growing faster than the number of guests making reservations means that on average, your average property is less booked. Combined with a 3% shorter average stay length, now you've got 10% fewer guest nights booked per property for this month. Rates down 4% year over year. 
combine those numbers, you've got a 14% decline in the amount of revenue per property for June, uh, which is, was a pretty peak month and always is for U.S. short-term rentals in a lot of markets. I'm going to keep moving us along. Let's talk about just some key takeaways for the U.S. before we move into what we're seeing in Europe. Um, kind of the biggest takeaway, the unicorn years are gone. So people are still traveling. They're not traveling to the same extent and supply has caught up so much. Uh, we've got to put our hands back on the wheel 2023 and adapt. It's time to, to look at your strategies and kind of stand strong against that competition. Uh, booking trends in 2023, booking windows continue to shift. So a lot of reservations coming 60 days plus out in advance of arrival or within 14 days. So it's a great time to kind of adjust your booking window strategy, focus on capturing bookings outside of your normal window, um, as well as what can you do on the front end to make sure guests are choosing your unit over your competitors. Is it pricing? Is it marketing? Is it your listing on Airbnb? Simon, I'm going to direct this question to you. Uh, somebody asked a really good question about what do you mean when you say you need to do more to justify the price? What are kind of some big strategies you can use right now to stand out over this increased competition and over hotels as well? Yeah, absolutely, Melanie. I'm mean, coming back to the point that I mentioned earlier. You know, one of the biggest weaknesses that the PMC still have today is communicating value proposition to homeowners. You know, the the, the average homeowner just does not understand or or have a good grasp on what is being done for the properties being managed this is not just throwing it on a channel and and and, and pay a channel commission it's actually you know being there for guests and, and and operating and whatever i mean you know a small example a life example we arrived a party of six in a house we had uh, two deck chairs so obviously we had to call them and say we need four more deck chairs <laughs> Uh, because otherwise we have fights with children and everything else. And, and obviously they came and addressed that immediately and, and, and brought us four more deck chairs uh, for the pool. So, you know, this is something the owner will, will, will never realize that it actually has taken place and, and everything else around it. So I think it's more about value creation and what needs to be done to support the current SDR customer. Turning the SDR customer back four years, you know, up to 2019, where STR had a 38% category awareness in relation to travel and hospitality. So only 38% of the travelers have used the product. Now it's at 80 and plus. Obviously, expectations have changed and homeowners are still the same. So they think, yeah, we have done very little in terms of upkeep and, and maintenance and, 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 you know, keeping the amenities off plates. Uh, knives, I just did a, a big blog post on LinkedIn again about kitchen knives, which are horrible in this place. Um, you know, it's the small things that make a difference. So the dialogue that that I think Jason has alluded to earlier just needs to happen. It needs to happen transparent and obvious and and and, and honest. And you know, I would I would even urge PMCs to be more strict in terms of inventories. It's not all about supply. It's quality of supply, and it's not the it's not the quantity. It's the quality. And and we can also lose uh, units. And you know, very few PMCs will admit that they forcefully reduce units to have a better performance because that's what needs to happen at the end of the day. Simon, I love that you mentioned knives. <laughs> Random, but when I travel to short-term rentals, if I'm driving, I still put like a nice set of knives and a cutting board in my luggage because I like to cook and you can't always rely on that. So maybe five years from now, we won't have to worry about knives and I won't have to pack half my kitchen to go stay in a house somewhere. Absolutely, Melanie, and I've been talking about this for more than 10 years, and I'm still like a broken record because I'm a passionate cook. That's what I do. That's why I want vacation rental, because I have time next to my professional life to enjoy the kitchen, and that's what most people do who travel with big parties. So it's actually quite obvious that people want to have a good equipped kitchen, which will change the experience quite substantially. Yeah, absolutely. And the last point here we, we talked a lot about earlier was just to be proactive with your homeowners. So, so that's one of the primary takeaways for what's happening in 2023. Make sure you're really being uh, proactive with your homeowners. Let's jump in uh, to Europe, talk about what's going on on the other side of the world as well. Um, so we've got a lot of the same charts that look familiar, but the trends are pretty different in Europe. 
So summer occupancy on the books as of July 4th, 2% uh, higher for Europe than the previous year. So at 46% occupied this year compared to 44%. Looks good overall. We are seeing some softening though in certain markets. So, so a, a substantial number of markets are pacing about 2 to 3% behind last year as well. Um, we're also here looking at peak season, kind of our off seasons, our, our late winter and spring, and then now this fall as well, I believe we're pacing a little bit behind prior year. So we're, we're seeing peak seasons in Europe continuing to increase on average, but some softening in kind of the shoulder seasons. Simon, you're obviously on the ground in Europe. What are you hearing and seeing from people there? Yeah, that's an interesting one, Melanie. Um, and as we had discussion prior to this webinar together, um, certain markets have, you know, shown me or, or, or communicate to me even a bigger softening. So we've spoke some, to some very large operators in, in France and, and some very large operator in Spain who have actually seen even stronger softening. So obviously your data is, you know, a blend of, of many different markets and, you know, breaking that down into certain markets, it might be even more challenging where, where the markets have become very price sensitive. For Spain, people tell me uh, people are waiting a lot longer to make a booking, uh, being super price sensitive. France domestic has softened quite a bit. And let's not forget France is a, is, is a heavy domestic demand market, probably about 70%. And, uh, and, and, and people have really waited for a long time. Obviously, there's a lot of political unrest in, in France. Uh, as well now um, and so you know I think this does not for me sort of show the picture uh, in relation to the conversation that AGL is currently having with some of the PMCs so they they see even a, a stronger softening than than what the data shows here but obviously it's a blend across several markets you have the UK Croatia uh, Greece uh, Spain and France uh, predominantly for key data dashboard um, so therefore, um, it, it needs to be um, deciphered in a different way. But we definitely see that the market is, um, is, is, is softening substantially from what we hear directly from the PMCs. Yeah, that's great perspective, Simon. Thanks for, for adding it. Um, rates, on the other hand, we, we see continue to, to increase year over year in Europe for our professional managers. Um, and so some of those top markets that Simon just referenced. So uh, about $216 on the books for the summer. This is US dollars still um, up from 198 last year. So still seeing about just under a 10% increase in rates year over year. Um, one of those Maybe things... one thing I want to add here, uh, Melanie, sorry to jump in. In relation to the US market, we definitely see a less invested market. So therefore, the exposure of homeowners in relation to loans and exposure on, on borrowed capital is potentially less. So therefore, this is more sustainable for homeowners as well. That's a great point, Simon. Thank you. Um, you're welcome to jump in anytime. Um, so still seeing rates on average increase in Europe. Um, but again, we're hearing that there's a lot of price sensitive sensitivity there as well. Again, like Simon referenced, kind of variation by markets. So don't take this and go bump all your rates up 10% over last year. Um, be sure to kind of have a, a good feel for what's happening in your local market. So not just your country, but your city or town, um, as well as the type of inventory you're managing as well. So revenue per night, also kind of on that recovery trajectory for Europe. So booked at about $100 per night across all nights. Um, on the books for this year so far, compared to $86 last year. So still a quite large increase in revenue um, and exceeding where Europe was pre-COVID in 2019 as well. Okay, booking trends uh, differ a lot in Europe as compared to the US. So the booking window is lengthening a little bit. Um, so at about 62 days on average for the summer, which is two days higher than 60 last year, still a little bit below where it was in, in um, 2019, kind of returning much closer to normal than in 2020, 2021. You notice that final booking window is shorter. 
a ton of people still have not booked their European summer stays yet. So as those reservations continue to come in closer to arrivals, it'll pull that average booking window down. Um, currently in Europe, most reservations on the summer are coming in uh, about zero to 14 days. So under two weeks in advance of arrival, it's increased by 7% year over year. In Europe, we're really seeing the softening and people booking 15 to 60 days from arrival. So both of those numbers of reservations per property down year over year. In Europe, this is interesting because again, it's juxtaposed to, to the US. 20% increase in the number of reservations per property for summer stays, book 60 plus days in advance. So to me, that's, that's signal, signaling some, some optimism and some willingness to put reservations and stays on the books for a couple months out in Europe. Um, again, different than the US where that number of kind of long and advanced reservations is declining. I think that also is in relation to what people can get in terms of deals as well and in, in, in how potentially PMCs have sort of priced um, their, their um, their properties as well so people are very conscious to book very early and we've seen some massive changes in the airline tariffs and we've seen the airline tariffs in europe have increased by 40 60 percent domestic like domestic pan-european airline prices uh, air, like ticket prices have, have increased substantially so i think the consumer behavior how to consume hospitality and travel is also changing that you know like early out they can potentially get a better deal than than uh, having it close to arrival date as well yeah great points and also i think great points and jason and i have talked about this about like, your pricing strategy does influence people to book earlier or later and so if people know hey occupancy is pretty low and people are going to uh, drop rates if i book late then they'll start booking late um so it's it's a tons of tricky balances right now, but that's certainly another balancing act that people are facing uh, with changes in year over year demand and booking trends as well. Looking at booking sources in Europe, uh, booking.com still king with about 3.6 arrivals per property for the summer booked um, through booking. It's higher than the runner up Airbnb and, and well above direct and Verbo, which are not as large of, of players in Europe as they are in the US. So booking up 11% year over year, Airbnb up 1%, rates increasing similarly across both of those platforms at 8% higher than last year. Percentage of revenue, uh, bookings really uh, taken quite a large chunk of the share in the past year. So up from 39% um, across our property managers last year to 43%, which is driving Airbnb share down a little bit, even though rates and overall reservation activity is increasing. So Airbnb down from 46% to, to last year to 43% this year. Yeah, I think just as a highlight from a European lens is obviously how booking is pacing away. I mean, this is absolutely incredible, 11%. Um, and then the ratio between direct bookings and other channels, like when you think about that Airbnb uh, is, is delivering a, a similar ADR to direct bookings where in the US it's nearly triple. So we've seen some very different market dynamics. Verbo, uh, quite interesting as well, that has, has increased their ADR, but their market share has not really increased as well. So, you know, and, and, and direct bookings um, in, 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 in Europe is, is, is actually not declining, but it's, 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 it's staying at like reasonably flat. So it's interesting if you compare that slide with the US market, how, how actually quite substantially different result it shows and who the players are. So once again, um, distribution is, remains one of the key things to think about uh, in, in our business. Yeah, no, notable to see how much booking is gaining on Airbnb over there. Kind of the success that they're having and what that portends for the U.S. opportunity. Yeah, and 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 you know that's something we we talked about many times, Jason. That's a great point you're raising here. I mean, yeah, we had all these fraudulent bookings and credit card challenges that booking had in the U.S. But you know, I, I I'm a strong believer that we'll get on top of that, and, and they will not 
leave the, the US market untouched and, and let us not forget that, you know, Booking has made an enormous amount of cash. Um, so they have cash to be deployed and they will not leave uh, the US market untapped. So I think also for the US listeners, you know, Booking.com is, is, not, a, is not a channel just to be ignored. Uh, it's, 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 it's huge and, and it's increasing its market share and, and they have definitely the US market as their top priority in terms of growth as well. Failing's also shortening slightly in Europe, so a little bit higher than pre-COVID um, at 5.6 days, but but well below uh, where they were in 2020. Um, just as in the U.S., kind of some smaller changes in Europe have added up uh, to a pretty bright future year over year. Um, so the number of properties under management is has grown more significantly in Europe, so 20% on average. Um, for again, this is just June. Lots more guests, so 30% more guest arrivals for our managers, um, balancing out to an 8% increase in the number of guests checking in for a property. Stay links coming down about 5% year over year, so that's moderating the number of guest nights booked per property. Rate increases um, contributed to about 10% increase in revenue per property uh, for June and Europe as a whole. So let's talk about big takeaways uh, for European property managers. Number one, keep adjusting your rates. So rates have increased some from last year, again, depending on the market. So know your mar market and your inventory type. Make sure that you're making reasonable adjustments and not driving these price conscious travelers away um, with the large year of your increases. So stay lengths have shortened slightly. It's a good time to consider length of stay pricing. Maybe you incentivize those longer stays so you don't have to deal with as many turnovers or implement a stay length minimum to make sure people aren't booking your property for only one or two nights per week. So right now you're gonna need more reservations to make up for shorter stays, or you can incentivize lengthening stays again. Similarly, adjust your strategy, focus on capturing bookings outside of your normal window. Again, think about kind of the, the, the takeaway Simon gave us for making sure that guests are choosing your unit over your competitors. And this holds true. Um, with, with slight changes, increases year over year, softening in some markets in Europe as well as the US, it is a great time to be proactive with your homeowners and get that homeowner communication strategy in place. Jason or Simon, any major takeaways from, from either of you for Europe? I just wanted to highlight number one there, you know, you, if you just look at the, at the macro level data you, you put there, um, it shows a pretty rosy picture, but if you, you start to peel back, as Simon said, and look at some of the regional numbers, as you alluded to, Melanie, you are starting to see some some signs of some pullback. Obviously, uh, the U.S. numbers where we start to see rates pull back, even at the macro level, are kind of a, a, a thing, most likely a, a tale of what's to come. Europe, I saw this morning, is is technically in a recession now with two quarters down. Uh, I know interest rates are easing a little bit, but if you look at just the cost of stuff over there, and we were talking with Simon this morning about it, the, the food and the services are still extremely high. Um, but you've, you've still got this pinup demand of people wanting to travel. I saw a European Travel Commission study that was done this past month. They kind of reflected that juxtaposition of demand being really strong, but people clearly um, being cautious in their spending going forward. And so, you know, I would be cautious in Europe as a PMC to kind of watch the particular comps in my area and see whether they continue to push prices higher, like you're seeing on the macro level, or uh, are they starting to pull back, right? You don't want to be the uh, the last one to pull back and you don't want to re over overreact on on pushing the rates up. And so I think more than ever for Europe, from my, my standpoint, the... Uh, the number one point there of kind of keeping a real close eye on rates over the next couple of months and seeing what the competitive landscape does and whether or not the demand kind of wins out or this cautiousness that we're seeing in all the surveys and um, and whatnot overwins or, you know, takes over versus the demand. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not much to add, Jason, uh, apart from the fact that next time you come to Switzerland, you visit me. Um, <laughs> You know, I think uh, <laughs> that's an insider, but I have to bring that up despite we're on a webinar. But no, I, I totally agree. I think we need to be cautious. You know, once 
the umbrella that I've used on stage in Spain as well as in the US was was on purpose. And I think, you know, when, when we see these type of numbers, you get euphoric, but when we speak to markets, it looks different. So I think we need to consume as much data as we can and, and get our own picture, speak to owners, you know, you understand your own markets as well, understand the larger scheme of things, what can change and what will have an impact in your current performance. Uh, from yeah. a macroeconomical standpoint, higher cost, uh, higher interest rates. What does that mean to your homeowner base, et cetera, et cetera, create relations. I think one of the best takeaways I had from Viramay Executive, uh, besides many other very interesting interviews, was, was Jason's statement to say, if you haven't built a good relation with your homeowner, now it's time to do that. And I think that summarizes it also for the European market and be selective so that you can deliver the best possible product that maximize your revenues with good solid uh, product and, and not just take supply because you want to take supply, be selective and, and have good supply so you can deliver up to expectations and, and maximize your return. So I think it summarizes it perfectly. And I know we only have three minutes left and so far we, we didn't receive a question, but I, I want to use that time to throw that back to Jason and be the devil's advocate. We have, um, we as a consulting firm, we, we obviously deal with a lot of different data providers and. And when we consume data for, for research work or whatever it, it might be, we see different type, four different uh, type of pictures. And, um, and uh, recently there have been some you know, incredible posts on, hey, the Phoenix market is dropped by 50%. Uh, we've seen you know, some market data from some of your competitors showing you know, it's only 11% or 10%. And, and, and this post had like four and a half million views and everybody was, up in arms, Airbnb is going down the drain because now everybody is, is sort of pulling out their properties on the market. But now we're seeing some good, consistent, solid market data from Key Data Dashboard today. And, and we, as professionals, ask ourselves, hey, how should we consume data today in, in, in our industry? And how should we interpret them, number two? And number three, how can we what can we do to deliver a more consistent story out there for, for us to make uh, interpretation and decisions on? Yeah, great question, Simon, I appreciate it. I mean, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's not necessarily always good data or bad data, it's what data are you looking at and for what reason, right? And um, I think in the instance of this Twitter post that kind of went viral there for a minute and then quickly got corrected by everybody, I think you just, from our viewpoint, we had bad data. Uh, out there in the marketplace that uh, didn't align with what we were seeing. It didn't align with what most of our competitors were seeing, and it certainly didn't align with what uh, Airbnb was seeing itself. Um, and we kind of all collaborated and I think uh, universally renounced that data set as just being, uh, you know, too exaggerated. Um, but, um, you know, to your point, I think, look, if you're looking at scrape data, which was kind of the... Uh, you know, the ubiquitous data point out there before key data started, and it was kind of all that was available. From my standpoint, it can be very helpful for identifying supply, what all is happening, whether that's at a macro or a micro level, just what's happening in terms of the overall supply. And that's, of course, important in terms of pricing. But when you're looking at what's happening with occupancy in particular and rates, uh, scrape data is harder to get right. It's harder for us and it's harder for our competitors to get right. And so you have to be cautious with it. And what we see when we look at, you know, the direct source data that we go out and get from pros and PMCs around the globe is typically that the scrape data occupancy will be a little inflated. It will have some, some owner stays or some holds uh, or just some down periods for a particular unit that show up as a gray box on the OTA and tend to look like a guest booking. And it's hard to be able to identify and pull all of those out when you're scraping data. So, uh, you know, when you're when you're looking at supply, I think scrape data can be a great uh, source. When you're looking at occupancy and ADR and there isn't any direct source data, I think scrape data is what it is. You've got to rely on it, it's the best we've got. But obviously the long tail here and the reason we started this company is we think that direct source data straight from the reservation systems ultimately gives you the best source, best visibility around what's happening in a market. So it's gonna take us a while. We've got great concentration in a ton of markets. We've got US uh, core leisure covered up. We're increasingly getting US um, urban 
uh, strong foot or stronghold there. And we've got teams around the globe now. And so, you know, for us, it's ultimately direct source wins in the long term. But I think if you're using the right data for the right purpose and you're being cautious about it, you can end up with the right results. Awesome. Well, I think we're up on the hour. Uh, we didn't receive a question. We thank everybody for the attendance of the webinar today together with uh, Key Data Dashboard. Thank you, Melanie, for putting that deck together. Thank you, Jason, um, and um, being here together, AGL and Key Data Dashboard have a great partnership. We deliver data, we interpret data, and we create actions out of it. So we're more than happy to support you guys going forward. Thank you for attendance. This um, webinar has been recorded. So of course, uh, all the attendants will receive that and also the ones who have uh, signed up for the webinar. And we wish everybody a super successful summer with numbers that are outpacing everything that we have seen. And uh, looking forward to the aftermath and maybe later this year, Q3, we'll jump back together again and, 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 and show the industry what has really happened. So thank you everyone. Wishing you all a great summer break and all the best, Jason. Thank you so much. Stay cool over there, Simon. I know it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Take Thanks, care, everybody. Guys.